Hello, everyone. Welcome to week six. And uh, we are going to be talking about these things that are about to come up in the next slide. So on this front slide, we have an artwork by Jacob Lawrence. And we're going to be taking a look at his Great Migration series this week. And so you'll have a video link that you'll follow on YouTube where you'll look at, um, I think it's about maybe nine or 10 minutes where you can look at artworks that he created and hear context about it and hear the story of the Great Migration. And so our next slide has some of the vocabulary terms that I may be using in this overview. So creative resistance, voice of a nation, I may talk about assimilation versus separatism. Black aesthetics, I just want to remind you, is a mixture of influences, folkways, multiculturalism, and education and training in the arts or any type of um, arts and literature, for example. So I just want to remind you again that most of Black aesthetics is coming, is a combination of cultural influences because African Americans are a mixture of, of, of coming from different ethnic groups in Africa originally. And then we constantly have other immigrants of African descent coming to the United States. So we have that mixing in too, especially from the Caribbean. And then we have a mix of cultures here in the United States. And so we, Black people are in proximity to other, other cultures where they can take in and exchange and mix. And then we have Black people who are actually going to get training in the arts for different things. And so that education and training, the formalism is sometimes mixed with these other influences, which still creates a Black aesthetic. And if you want to take it another step further, it is an aesthetic of Africans and African continuity an African principle is addition versus subtraction or minimalism. Now there can be those things that exist, but in general, there is a West African principle of adding, taking in from everywhere, anything that's great, anything that's excellent and layering it, mixing it together to create a new type of art form or aesthetic. Other terms, freedom, dreams, pride, dignity, respect. And again, I already said the term migration and I'm saying it again. You're gonna be looking at a film this week by Oscar Michaud. Uh, we will consider him a voice of the nation. How does an artist or a creative person become a voice of the nation? That's such a big title. Does someone set out to become that? Do they just, they just make something and it just it has its finger on the pulse of the times and then they become a voice of the nation? These are questions. Uh, bring your gifts to the movement. So when we talk about creative resistance, even the, I heard the founder of Black, um, I'm sorry, not the founder, but the leader of Black Lives Matter LA say just a few days ago, whatever your gifts and talents are, how do you bring them to the movement? What are your gifts and talents? What can you bring to the movement? Everyone has a way to serve. And so African-Americans have historically fought for freedom, freedom using strategies of creative resistance. And so that includes the arts. So the, the film that you're going to watch is the earliest surviving film by an African-American director, filmmaker. He self-financed his films. They were not studio productions. And so there's always been a tradition from the very first films um, being made by African-Americans of independent Black filmmaking. And so, uh, so uh, the film that you're going to watch is called Within Our Gates, and it is an act of creative resistance in the sense of it being a response film to Birth of the Nation, which had uh, its main Black characters being played by white people in Blackface. So they, you know, smeared stuff on their face to look Black, and then they played horrible stereotypes of Black people, every type of stereotype, the worst stereotypes that white people had of Black people is what is how they presented African Americans in what was to be considered the first major full length feature film of the United States of America. And even 15 years ago, you could still find this film on the top 100 greatest films of all time from the United States. So you'll have um, a 10 minute video introducing you to what Birth of a Nation was about, 
and then how within our gates responds to birth of a nation and just how terrible it was. It was so terrible, in fact, that KKK membership increased significantly, and so did the killings and lynchings of Black people throughout the United States of America as a direct result of the film. Uh, why Poe Rob Robeson matters. So there's an, another um, little video you can watch about one of the first Black actors to have international success as an actor, and he was also an activist. So when we talk about creative resistance, we're also talking about Black artists who also, um, in addition to doing what they did and trying to be excellent at it, were also fighting for civil rights, for freedom, for equity, for dignity, for respect, for African Americans and people of African descent in general. So Paul Robeson is one of those. He was a singer and actor and, and an activist and a public speaker. He um, kind of got blacklisted because he was sympathetic to the Communist Party and the Socialists. And so there was a period of time in US history when that was like, um, you know, a really, really, really um, a thing that could get you exiled and blacklisted in the United States or exiled out of the United States and blacklisted from whatever your career was. So another voice of the nation um, is this song called Freedom. And it was first originally performed by a singer named Joy in the mid nineties, but then it became a soundtrack song in which um, some of the top R&B singers and rappers of the mid 90s came together and then performed it together. So Panther was a film about the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. We'll talk more about that particular group later on. The, per the person who is the first to sing on the song was Vanessa Williams, who was the first Black Miss America. And <laughs> since you just finished reading, the bluest eye, you can see here that, you know, our Vanessa Williams is kind of like a Maureen type, light skin with light colored eyes, sandy hair. Um, not surprising she would be chosen as um, the first Miss America. And also she was really actually beautiful and talented, very talented. In fact, she suffered a fall from grace because um, shortly after she was crowned, there was a nude picture or photos found of her that of her like posing nude. I mean, that's all she was doing was posing nude. And maybe they were for a sexy magazine or something like that. And they took her crown. And I can still be, remember being a child and being so sad after the first Black Miss America was crying on an airplane. And they showed video of her crying on an airplane because her crown was taken. And then, you know, that's hard to swallow that we had a first lady who just came out of office who had nude photos all over the internet and still became the first lady of the United States. And so um, the thing about Vanessa Williams is that she was incredibly resilient and she went on to have um, a career. She rebuilt herself um, and really, you know, kept kicking herself by the bootstraps. She actually ended up being married to Rick Fox, a really famous basketball player. You're also gonna watch This Is America it is a music video by Childish Gambino, AKA Danny Glover. It went viral and was really talked about just a few years ago, like within the past four or five years. The video came out shortly after um, nine black people were killed by a racist young white boy in Charleston, South Carolina. And so what you're gonna be looking for in this video is not only the art of it, but what's being critiqued? What is the statement? What is the social commentary? Is hip hop being critiqued? Is all of the United States being critiqued? Is violence in America being critiqued? What's being critiqued? Uh, Childish Gambino actually does not give any statements about what it's about. And artists sometimes do that. They make a thing and then they, you know, they say it's, I want the people to tell me what they got out of it. And that's what he did with this particular video. And then next we have, oh, this is just another moment from the same video. Maya Angelou, you'll be um, listening to a poem that she wrote, Another Voice of the Nation. Uh, Maya Angelou had a career as a writer and a poet and definitely rubbed shoulders with some of the most famous 
black people and famous people of the of of the 20th century but there are photos of her in africa with malcolm x and other famous activists and um, she was quite a diva and so she wrote an autobiography called i know why the cage bird sings it was made into a film in 1979 and the poem is a poem that um, children often recite in schools now. Jacob Lawrence is a visual artist, mostly a painter. And this photo that you see here is him with his wife, Gwendolyn, who was also an artist. I heard from some of their contemporaries, though, that her career never got a chance to take off as much as his because she was the one supporting him in his career. And you know, we find that that is often the case with women at times that they are setting their career aside, careers aside and helping the men. Jacob Lawrence was the first African-American artist, visual artist to have commercial success in the United States who was completely trained by black artists. And one of his main teachers was Augusta Savage, the sculptor that you see here to the right with some of her sculptures. Jacob Lawrence grew up in Harlem and where he witnessed so many Black people coming out of the South into the North. And so he has many paintings about this journey. It was a very significant journey. Um, here's some quotes that you can read from Jacob Lawrence about being an artist and about um, having a kind of activist spirit to the arts. And you can read those on your own. You can pause the video and read them. This is one of his paintings here. You can see some of the places that Black people were going at the time. Chicago, New York, and St. Louis, urban cities. You could think of um, Black America as a nation within a nation without its own land. So Native Americans have reservations, but Black Americans never had land of their own in a way um, in that, that was officially recognized by the United States of America. Pretty much, we can argue that point on a couple of maroon, a few maroon settlements, but that's a whole other subject. In general, there was no large amount of land that was set aside specifically for Black people to live on and conduct themselves as they would like to. So the Great Migration lasted from 1915. Usually, people, usually history books say about 1915 until 1960. But this map says 1970. And so I've seen statistics as high as 6 million out of 10 million Black Americans moving out of the South, North, and West. And so basically, for sure, it's half, half of all African Americans that were in the United States at that time. So here's some more statistics and facts that you can take a look at. I'm not sure why there's no numbers right here over the 60s and, seven, uh, 60s and 70s. I don't, I'm not really sure why, but you can Google it. And then you also have a, a chapter to read in Black Art and Culture. We read um, The Dark Center before and you had a quiz, but this time you're just going to make some visual notes. And um, on the side here, there's a painting by William H. Johnson called Jitterbugs. And you can see that the woman's face is black um, and her hands, but that her legs are light. And the reason why is because at the time of World War II, there was a shortage of, I can't remember, some type of material that was used to make pantyhose. And then they only had like one color. So that color was for white women. And so black women, when they wore pantyhose, they had to wear the white women's color. And so it was always going to be a lighter color than, not always, but it was often going to be a lighter color um, if, if the woman was going to be a darker skinned woman. So the artist has actually painted that. He has like made a note of that in the painting. It's a really kind of funny thing to put into the painting. William H. Johnson did like 700 or more paintings during his lifetime, but he only painted in this style for a specific period of time. Um, he was extremely prolific, and this style was specifically influenced by Black folk art. Um, he had paintings that he did that were more classically European. He spent time in Europe. He even had a European wife. Um, he ended up dying of um, syphilis. So syphilis hit uh, African-American communities, or I should say creative communities, but specifically creative African-American communities really hard 
um, at a certain point of time in the early 20th century, the way that HIV or AIDS hit in the 80s. And so we lost a lot of really talented people or they, you know, had issues. So he, he ended up having mental health issues. I'm not sure if they were directly a result of syphilis or not, but um, he he's one of my particular, Jacob Lawrence and um, William H. Johnson are two of my favorite artists. Um, so here you can see that he's dealing with police violence and then um, as an issue in the urban cities. And on this side, you can see that um, that uh, abolition is a concern of his or you know the end of the chain gangs or some kind of commentary on black men being imprisoned. Uh, Elizabeth Catlett is another artist that's brought up in the essay and she was one of the first black American women to have some notoriety as an artist in the United States and it was around the 40s and 50s when she started to get this notoriety. She was also sympathetic to the communist movement as many of our activists and artists were who were African American. Part of the reason why is because they saw such a deep connection between class oppression and race oppression. And so they were looking to the communist movement as possibly a way to um, combat both and transform American society for equality for black people. It's almost impossible to have this type of equality without also challenging the class system, the caste system. So um, she went into exile into Mexico and took a husband there. And I talked about her before, her grandchildren, two of her grandchildren live here in the, um, in the United States. and. Um, one of them was recently on Top Model. So here's a quote of hers talking about creative resistance. And she became a voice of the nation also. Rose Piper is another artist that's mentioned in the chapter. And I have to admit, I never heard of her until reading the chapter. So I learned new things constantly also. And then there's this other problem, which is a problem throughout history, which is some Black artists just don't get written about. They don't get written about. You don't get, you don't learn them. Maybe some of you have come to this class like, wow, I never learned these things before. How come I never knew these things? Well, I'm the age that I am and I'm still learning things too and angry that I never got a chance to learn them before. So um, reading the chapter, I discovered a new artist that I hadn't heard before. So um, her name is Rose Piper. And so she traveled through the South and won some awards and some fellowships to be able to travel and to make artwork. And she was extremely inspired by the blues and wanted to bring the blues as an aesthetic into her work. So you can see in this particular painting right here that there is a sort of sad blueness that's like literally in the painting. And this painting was done in the 80s or 90s. And you can see a totally different flavor to it, a totally different flavor and style. Um, she spent some time as a painter, but her, her main occupation was a textile designer, I believe, and she did some other things that were creative and artistic, but not as a fine art painter, but she came back to it a little later in life. Um, and what, what do artists dream? What, what are the dreams of African Americans? And so how can we interpret them? Are they always political? This artist, Minnie Evans, has uh, African American and Caribbean ancestry. And she was an, she's considered a folk artist in that she probably didn't have a lot of formal schooling. She probably didn't make a lot of money. She probably didn't have any formal training as an artist, but she was extremely prolific as an artist. And so she's known for these kind of um, whimsical fantasy like drawings that have like a lot of botanical flavor to them. She's mentioned in this week's reading as well. James Hampton is also mentioned, and this is uh, made from aluminum foil. So James Hampton, just to give you a sense of the scale, this is him standing with part of it. He lived in Washington, DC, and he apparently was making this masterpiece in his garage, these, this sculptural installation in his garage, and no one knew he was making it, and he died, and people found it, and we were like, what is this? And it is actually at the Smithsonian now, it's in the Smithsonian's collection. He's another artist I said that was mentioned in the chapter. And then I think we're getting to the end of the slideshow. It's a short one this week. Um, I'm bringing Zora Neale Hurston back in a quote by her. The whole matter revolves around the self-respect of my people. How much satisfaction can I get from a court order for somebody to associate with me who does not wish me near them? 
So when we talk about these aspirations of freedom, which you're going to be looking at and thinking about in all the material that you're assigned to interact with this week, um, also understand that sometimes there's conflict with black within black thought. Not everyone thinks the same. Not everyone believes in the same strategy or people who may have different ideas about certain outcomes or strategies. So Zora Neale Hurston, who you watched, you have, uh, you watched Their Eyes Were Watching God, and she wrote that in the novel that it was adapted from. She was actually one of the most famous people who was not so much on the bandwagon for desegregation. So it wasn't so much that she was not on the bandwagon for desegregation, but she felt that there was more to value to getting equality within black things like black schools, black neighborhoods, having black, black everything, get the resources that it needed to be equal to whites. So it's not that she felt that black people and white people should not mix or be equal, but she felt too much emphasis was being placed on black people entering into white spaces. And so um, I've included a reading where you can kind of hear about this point of view, because mostly when we talk about civil rights, we only hear about the assimilation side, that Black people wanted to assimilate into the mainstream, that Black people wanted what white people had, that Black people felt that in order to be equal, they had to be with white people. But there were Black people who did not believe that. And so I want you to also see and hear um, some other opinions on the subject. There are, there are definitely data out there that shows that um, for this particular era compared to the segregation era, there were more black owned businesses. Some people, some scholars argue that black people were doing better overall because we had to go to our own banks, go to our own businesses, be taught by ourselves and that it was a much more caring and nurturing environment for all black people. So, um, Again, that's just something that I want you to be thinking about. And it's just an introduction to the idea. This is, I think, the last slide in the slideshow and just wanna bring about the word dignity. So as we transition from the, the essay that you're, I mean, I'm sorry, the chapter that you're reading on art, black art is 1945 to about 1960. So that's what it covers as far as visual culture and the strategies that creatives had and how they were going to present black people to the world. So now we are kind of like getting to the 1960s where things radically change and shift. So we can see here a line of black men wearing the sign, I am a man. And there's one sympathizer, I guess, in there or some sympathizers who don't have on um, a, a sign that says I am a man. And we also see guns pointed at all of them. And so with that note, I think that's the last slide of the week. And I hope you enjoy all of the material that you're going to see.